If you're in need of inspiration, hope, or finding your true purpose in life, this podcast is for you. Reggie Selma, legendary former CNN photojournalist and world-renowned inspirational speaker. Inspire Fest, are you ready? Interviews natural. guests with Mar- triumphant Mar- stories Mar- to Mar- fuel Mar- your purpose. And now, here's your host, Reggie Selma. An Inspired Life podcast is back. And we return with a new logo and more in-depth blog posts. Now you can still listen to my show wherever you get your podcast, but now you can watch our amazing episodes on my new YouTube channel. But most importantly, it's our incredible guests and their stories of resilience. When life knocks them down, their toughness shines through like the Maya Angelou poem, Still I Rise. And our first guest of our podcast, Rebirth, is the courageous story of Dr. Charlotte Laws. Charlotte is an accomplished author, Emmy-nominated TV pundit and speaker, but Charlotte's most important title, Mom. And you'll hear why as she describes her courageous fight to have her daughter's hat, personal and intimate photos taken down from a website that trafficked in revenge porn. And Charlotte's amazing story is also the focus of a powerful Netflix docudrama, The Most Hated Man on the Internet. Charlotte, welcome to An Inspired Life. Thanks for having me. Now, Charlotte, in 2010, your daughter Kayla, then 24, had her personal email account hacked. Tell us about that day. What happened? Well, when her account was originally hacked, she didn't know why they were hacking her. And we just assumed it had to do with some kind of financial information they were after. So I told her to change her passwords for bank accounts, et cetera. And it wasn't until several months later when her topless picture was loaded to the most notorious revenge porn website. And that's when she realized that's what they were after is that picture. And she never sent that picture to anybody. So she knew it was from the hacking. When did she find out that her pictures were on the internet? It was in January of the next year. And um, she was at her job. She had a waitress job. She was an aspiring actress, but she also was a part-time waitress. And one of her friends called her during her shift and told her that she was on the site along with her name, her city, and her social media link. And she was just devastated and freaked out. And she couldn't even understand how it got on there initially. And um, it was you know, very difficult for her to finish that shift at work. And um, she came home and just you know, didn't want to you know, communicate with the world. She did call me though from her work and told me what had happened. And I checked out the site. I'd never heard of revenge porn. I um, knew that that picture had to come down immediately because I knew it would multiply in cyberspace. You know, a topless picture is not going to just go away on its own. It's going to get picked up by site after site. And uh, so I started investigating the website owner and his website. I asked him uh, to take the picture down, which he refused to do. And I knew I was going to have to put a lot of effort into getting that content removed. The hacker's name is Hunter Moore. His accomplice, Charles Evans. Can you tell our listeners how did they technically get into your daughter's email account? Well, they were going at it through Facebook. So essentially, my daughter actually lives fairly close to Charlie Evans, who was he was the one who was actually physically doing the hacking. And Hunter Moore was paying him to do the hacking. And so what he was doing is he'd get into one of his friends' Facebook's account, and then he would get into the the friend of the friend and the friend of the friend. You know, he would start taking over accounts. She had taken, you know, a bunch of pictures in her room. Most of them were just, there was one that was topless. They were mostly just cutesy pie, little modeling type of pictures in, you know, different outfits, et cetera. And she had sent them to her um, computer to save them because her phone got full. And this was back in the time when phones got full, (laughs) you didn't have enough space. So that's how, that's how it all started. I've heard you call this website, Is Anyone Up Since Taken Down, was all about destroying lives. What did you mean by that? 
Yeah, the website owner called himself a professional life ruiner. Um, he used Charles Metzen language. He was the father. His followers were the children. They were in toto the family. It was about bullying. It was about literally just abusing people. It wasn't about nude pictures at all. It was about embarrassing people, trying to drive them to suicide, getting them fired from their jobs, sending their nude pictures out to their clients or their family or their employer. And it was a game for these people, you know, these trolls. And he had 600,000 followers on Twitter. He had 30 million page views per month. It was a huge website. And the media back then were glorifying him. They were giving him headlines. Oh, wow, isn't this cool? His business model, you know, he was on mainstream media shows. He was, he was loving the spotlight. He was getting attention from everybody from, as I said, the media all the way to his, his followers who, you know, just enjoyed hurting mostly females. It was mostly women who were depicted on the site. Prior to this sudden upheaval, describe your, your life before all of this happened. Well, we had a peaceful you know, family life. My daughter lived at home. And uh, so she was in her early 20s at the time. And I have a husband, uh, an Englishman who, uh, you know, was an attorney, he's retired now. And I was doing real estate part time. I was also a um, commentator on the NBC show, The Filter. So I was doing that. I was, you know, immediately canceling everything and saying, I've got to get this, this content down, you know, before anything else, because it really could ruin someone's life. And, um, uh, you know, over 50% of victims contemplate suicide and 93% suffer severe emotional distress. So it really is a big deal. Did you go to the police department? Yes, my daughter and I went to the police department and we got the victim blaming. It was a middle-aged uh, female detective who said to my daughter, why would you take a picture like this if you didn't want it on the internet? And my daughter was just, you know, pulling her hat over her face. She was so embarrassed. And then I um, called the FBI when we got home and the FBI were, did not do the victim blaming, but they didn't want to take the case, I think, because they just had too many cases. Oh, I see. You help Scarlett Johansson when she gets hacked, but you don't help the average person. And the person on the phone sighed and said, let me transfer you to a detective. And then I was told that there would be three agents coming to my house in several weeks. In the meantime, Kayla's photo is still on the site. So here I am. I'd never heard of revenge porn before. Never heard of this website. You're a suburban I, mom. I know two people on the site and they were both hacked. So I think, hmm, I wonder if there's a hacking scheme. And the reason this was important is because there were no laws against revenge porn at that time. So that's when I decided to do a little study and I started contacting people who were depicted on the site to find out how they got on there. Not only are you fighting for your daughter, but you are fighting for other people who have been hacked and victimized and sexually abused, if you will. Right. You do that. Why didn't you just stop at your daughter? Eventually we got the picture down, my daughter's picture down. And, um, and I had tried calling everybody associated with him from his advertisers, his publicists. I called his lawyer. I even tried to call his mom. I mean, I was just doing everything I could to get her picture down. And finally, I got that down. But, and my family wanted me to stop. But I was like, uh, I can't do that. There are all these other victims on the website. We don't even have laws in place. I have to keep working on this. This is a cause. And I knew it was a cause within one or two days of this whole thing happening. I've talked to over 800 victims uh, to date in the past 12 years. What was the reaction of the other young women when all of a sudden they get this lifeline, you fighting for them? What, what was their reaction when they heard this stranger wanting to, to help them? Well, I mean, a lot of them had no one to talk to. 50% of the time when I was helping victims, I was the first one to tell them they were on the website. So they were- They didn't even know. No, they were hysterical. I mean, they would have found out probably 24 hours later or something, but you know, I was watching and when a picture would come up, I would immediately see it and then contact the person. So, you know, I was, I felt like a suicide hotline. I mean, these people were in tears, they were freaked out. And, you know, I was in tears a lot. It was really, really difficult doing this. And it certainly was not very pleasant. It was very painful doing this and talking to these people who were in such severe pain. Hunter Moore, seemingly feeling very sure of himself, made a TV appearance on the Dr. Drew show. And you confronted him 
albeit split screen on that same show. Was that your first time going that public with your fight against him? That was the first time. And I was very nervous about it. It was, it was a difficult appearance because the FBI was also kind of in my ear saying, don't say this, don't say that, don't be too emotional. I mean, they had all this advice and I was like getting all this information about what I could or couldn't do. And it made it really, I think it was kind of the hardest TV appearance I've ever done. Plus I was coming out and accusing him of the hacking. And he immediately denied the hacking. At one point, he had followers, I think they call themselves the family. Mm -hmm. Were you in fear of your safety and your family as well? Yes, definitely. Um, he had these rabid followers and I was getting death threats. I was getting computer viruses. And I even had a stalker at the house, which is not even in the docuseries, but there was a guy in a white car parked out front on two separate occasions. The second time I marched out there, uh, Kayla was running behind me going, mom, what are you gonna do? Mom, what are you gonna do? Right. And, and I went up to the window and I said, may I help you? And he just freaked out. He just turned on the car and zoomed away. He almost hit my neighbor's wall trying to get away. I bought locks for the gates. I was, I was really afraid somebody could come on the property. I knew that they knew where I lived because various people had phoned and said, we know where you live. And I had, you know, been getting a lot of threats and you don't know these people are anonymous. You don't know if they just got out of prison. You don't know if they have guns. You don't know if they have anger issues. I mean, it's scarier when they're anonymous because you don't know who the enemy is. And Hunter Moore had so many rabid followers that it could be any of them. Did you ever feel like just giving up and hoping this would go away? I mean, you're being stalked. People are calling your home, trying to hack into your own account. Did you ever say, this is just too much? You know, I never did say that. I really, you know, I've always been a cause oriented person and, you know, feel like, you know, protecting victims is important all the way back to my childhood, fighting for civil rights and gay rights and animal rights. And this is women's rights mostly because it's women who are victimized with regards to revenge porn. So I never had any desire to give up or quit. And I think, you know, I'm the kind of person that the more attacks I get, the more likely I'm going to try to fight it and, and prevail. So that's kind of how I felt. Fierce mom. <laughs> I try to be. Now, without getting too technical, how did the FBI gather enough evidence against Hunter Moore and his accomplice, Charles Evans? Well, they got, they basically used the website to piece the information together, as well as they raided his house and Charlie Evans' houses. They got the um, technology, they got their computers and their cell phones, et cetera. But Hunter had forgotten that the entire website was in the cloud. And so the FBI was able to get into the cloud and piece it together that way. So it was hacking and unauthorized access to a, a computer and it was conspiracy charges. And they ended up doing a plea deal in the end. They pleaded well, guilty. How much time did they get? They only ended up getting two and a half years in prison. They were originally looking at 42 years in prison each. In the courtroom on the day Hunter Moore and Charles Evans were sentenced for their crimes, Kayla addressed them face to face with a powerful and emotional impact statement. My privacy was violated by Hunter Moore, a guy I did not know, a total stranger. He called himself a professional life ruiner, and that's exactly what he did to me. I found out my photos were online while at my then waitressing job. I felt exposed, ashamed, and broke into tears. I was hoping no one would see it, but within a day, I lost a role in a film, not to mention the tens of thousands of strangers who saw, commented on, or even possibly saved the photo. While trying to remove the photo from the internet, my mom received threatening phone calls and tweets from members of Hunter Moore's cult. Some people said they would kill her. This terrified me. I will carry the trauma of this experience with me for the rest of my life. How did that make you feel watching your daughter so bravely face her abusers in that way? 
Yeah, I was very proud of her. I mean, she's, um, it's always been a very difficult thing for her. She's had mixed feelings where she knows it's an important issue and she wants to help end revenge porn. But on the other hand, she gets fearful that it could hurt her career and that people could see it and then judge her. So um, lately though, she's become much more, you know, able to lean into it and to, you know, embrace it, I would say. But on that day, it was a very hard thing for her to be in court making that testimony because, you know, she didn't really like people knowing that she was a victim of it. Some people uh, have that resilience and you and your family did. Where, where does that strength come from? Not to just fold and, and take it. I think, I believe very strongly that genetics is, is powerful and I was adopted at birth and uh, really had no connection with my adoptive family, but tracked down my birth parents. And I feel like, you know, a lot of that is genetic. And my grandfather, for example, was Italian. And this was back when there was a lot of racism against Italians. They were, um, you know, he was kicked out of his house because the CCNR said, you know, no blacks, no Italians, et cetera, et cetera. He was kicked out of two law offices for being Italian. And he kept fighting, you know, he was able to become a lawyer. He was from a very poor family that worked in the coal mines back in West Virginia. And he was going to be a um, congressional candidate uh, for political office. So I feel like, you know, this kind of fighter spirit, it's nothing to do with me. It comes from my ancestors. <laughs> and I'm just thankful I have good genes. <laughs> You're carrying the torch very well, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Due to the courage of Dr. Charlotte Law's and her daughter, Kayla, there are now 48 out of 50 states in America that have revenge porn laws. That is truly inspiring. Charlotte, if my listeners want to find out more about you and your fight or to help you, how can they reach you on social media? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter and the handle is at Charlotte Laws and I'm on Instagram and it's at Dr. Charlotte Laws. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And that's the latest episode of An Inspired Life. Spread the word about our podcast. Tell family and friends. Post us on social media. Let's start an inspired life movement as we bring you triumphant stories to fuel your purpose. Thanks for listening. I am a person that believes in speaking goodness into existence. To find out more about Reggie and how you can inspire your audiences at future events or conferences by booking Reggie as a keynote speaker or MC, make sure to check out his website at aninspiredlifepodcast.com. That's an inspired life podcast with no spaces between the words dot com. And while you're there, make sure to subscribe and leave a review.